make sure that the job, which is literally never done, does not can con- does not continue to spill over into personal life and cost you relationships and other things that matter. Put limits on special projects that are going to take more time than usual. Make sure overtime does not become a pattern. Our work is part of our identity that is in that it taps into our particular giftedness and the exercise of those gifts in the community. Do not confirm to the pa- do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, is good, pleasing, and perfect will. Finding the kind of work that fits you, finding the kind of work that fits your strengths and passions involves taking risks. First, you need to firmly establish your identity, separating yourself from those who from those you are attached to and following your desires. First, you need to firmly establish your identity, separating yourself from those you are attached to and following your desires. You must take ownership of how you feel, how you think, and what you want. You must assess your talents and limitations, and then you must begin to set, step out as God leads you. You must take ownership of how you feel, how you think, and what you want. You must assess your talents and limitations, and then you must begin to step out as God leads you. As you develop your talents and skills, look at your work as a partnership between you and God. He has given you gifts and he wants you to develop them. Commit your way to the Lord and you will find your work identity. Ask him to help. Until you face your own feelings, you can't even see who others really are. You're looking at them through your own distortions, through your own unfinished business. When you see others clearly without transference, you will know how to deal with them. Avoid trying to gain the approval of overly critical types. It will never work and you will only feel controlled. Avoid getting into arguments with discussion. Avoid getting into arguments and discussions. You will never win. Keep your boundaries. Don't get sucked into their game. Stand apart from the critical person and keep one's boundaries. Have an, accurate, have an accurate appraisal of yourself and then disagree internally. Limits on good things, keep them good. You only have the power to change yourself. You can't change another person. Say no to the unimportant. You need to make a plan to accomplish the important things and erect some fences around your tasks. Make sure you do not allow work to control your life. Having limits will force you to prioritize. Say yes to the best and sometimes say no to the good. If you think your time is limitless, you may say yes to everything. You also need to set limits on yourself. You need to realize how much time and energy you have and manage your work accordingly. Know what you can do and when you can do it and say no to everything else. Learn to know your limits and enforce them. Say no, say to your team, boss or self. If I am going to do A today, I will not be able to do B until Wednesday. Is that okay? Or do we need to rethink which one I need to be working on? Set boundaries on your work. Decide how much overtime you are willing to do. Some overtime during seasonal crunches may be expected of you. Review your job description, if one exists. Make a list of tasks you need to complete in the next month. Make a copy of the list and assign your own priority to each item. Indicate on this list any tasks that are not part of your job description. Make an appointment with your boss to discuss your job overload. Together, review the task list. Ask boss to prioritize. You owe no one an explanation about why you will not do something that is not your responsibility. The Bible requires responsible action out of the one who was given, who it is given to. The Bible requires responsible action out of the one who is given to. If you do not see it after a season, set limits. Boundaries are about freedom, self-control, responsibility, and love. Find the misery and make a rule. Freedom equals responsibility. Responsibility equals love. When we anticipate not doing that desired thing, we become anxious and driven. Thus, FOMO. FOMO has a deeper aspect, a dependency issue happens when individuals don't feel solid and complete on their own 
and or require constant contact with others. Engage with the people you are with. How it feels to talk to them. Relationship and love both fill us up and displace fear and anxiety. Focus on creating a life of freedom. Remember that successful people are autonomous, self-directed people. Observe regular non-digital time periods. Think through the why of your FOMO. Train the people in your life not to expect an instant response. We all have to miss out on something in life to get somewhere. Be more focused on what you're getting and realize that you're missing out on the right thing in order to have the best life. Protect your most valuable assets, relationships. Digital communication is more convenient, but ultimately inferior to face-to-face -face communication. Intimacy is not a luxury, but a necessity. People without enough intimate relationships in life have more medical and psychological problems. Whenever you have the opportunity, set a limit on the digital and default to face-to-face. -to, -face. to be deeply connected in satisfying, safe, and vulnerable relationships, we need to express who we are at many levels and experience others at those same levels. The best relationships exchange information about feelings, passions, thoughts, and opinions. Email is great for instantly communicating an idea, plan, or feeling by typing and sending it. Synchronous communication. No timeline. Face-to-face. -face. Video. Phone. Asynchronous, not relayed or received instantly, email, texting, social media. From birth, we are designed to communicate directly and simultaneously. We need warmth to convey difficult truths and warmth doesn't happen when you can't see the other person's face or hear the inflection that in that person's voice. Human beings learn empathy by experiencing the emotional expressions of others. Calendarize your important relationships. Just as you schedule your job, your exercise, and your evenings out, schedule some time every month for the people who mean something to you and schedule it for real, synchronous conversations. Don't leave things to chance with people who matter to you. Be the initiator of synchronous communication, going to a restaurant. Most of the time, one person needs to champion change and growth in a relational system. Just step up and be that person. Use asynchronous communication for fill-in as a way to pop in on people. Use asynchronous communication for fill-in as a way to pop in and let people know a thought you have or that you want to know how they're doing. Supplement synchronous, commun con supplement synchronous connections, not to replace them. A full life is one in which you are investing your time and energy in relationships and activities that are meaningful, enjoyable, and worth engaging in. This can run the gamut of finding and following God's mission in life for you, having deep and vulnerable conversations with loving people, discovering and expressing your passions, and developing ways to give back and serve others. With the right boundaries and rules in place, you can have the time you need to connect with the people with whom you want to connect and to accomplish the tasks you need to comp complete. It won't take an overhaul of your time and effort, and the results will be more than worth it. The life before God is not worth holding on to. We must lose it, grieve it, and let go so that he can give us good things. We tend to hold on to the rope that someday they will love me. We tend to hold on to the hope that someday they will love me. This wish must be mourned and let go so that our hearts can be open to the new things that God wants for us. To set boundaries is to risk losing the love that you have craved for a long time. To say no to a controlling parent is to get in touch with the sadness of what you do not have with them instead of still working hard to get it.
Accepting the reality of who they are and letting go of the wish for them to be different is the essence of grief, and that is sad indeed. Giving up boundaries to get love postpones the inevitable. Giving up boundaries to get love postpones the inevitable. The, re the realization of the truth about the person. Giving up boundaries to get love postpones the inevitable. The realization of the truth about the person, the embracing of the sadness of that truth, and the letting go and moving on with life. The problem is not that you are with a bad person and your misery is that person's fault. The problem is that you lack boundaries. Don't blame someone else. You are the one with the problem. Realize the resistance because you are afraid. Seek growth and truth. You need the support of others to help you own up to your internal resistance and also to empower you to do the work of grief. Good grief can only take place in relationship. We need grace from God and others. Identify the wish. Behind the failure to set limits is the fear of loss. Identify whose love you are going to have to give up if you choose to live. Your strong tie to that person is keeping you stuck. Let go. In the safety of your supportive relationships, face what you will never have from this person or who this person symbolizes. This will be like a funeral. You will go through the stages of grief, denial, bargaining, anger, sadness, acceptance. You may not go through all stages of grief, denial, bargaining, anger, sadness, acceptance, in order. Probably feel all these motions. This is normal. Get with your supportive people and talk about your losses. These wishes run very deep and may be very painful to face. You may need to see a professional counselor. To let go of what you never had is difficult. In the end, you will save your life by losing it. Only God can fill the empty place with the love of his people and himself. Move on. Finding what you want is the last step in grieving. God has a real life out there if you are willing to let go of the old one. All of your attempts to preserve the old life were taking a lot of energy and opening you up to a lot of abuse and control. Letting go is the way to serenity. Grief is the path. Grief is the path. If angry people can make you lose your boundaries, you probably have an angry person in your head that you still fear. You will need to work through some of the hurt you experienced in that angry past. A hurt, frightened part of you needs to be exposed to the light and the healing of God and his people. You need love to allow you to let go of that angry parent and stand up to the adults you now face. Make sure you have your support system in place. If you are going to set some limits with a person who has controlled you with anger, talk to people in your support system first and make a plan. Know what you will say. Anticipate what the angry person will say and plan your reaction. You may even want to role play the situation with your group. Make sure your support group will be available to you right after the confrontation. Some members of your support group can go with you. Do not allow the angry person to get you angry. Be prepared to use physical distance and other limits that enforce consequences. I will not allow myself to be yelled at. I will go into the other room until you decide you can talk about this without verbally attacking me and raising your voice. When you can do that, I will talk to you. You can empathize lovingly and stay in the conversation without giving in or being controlled. I understand that you are upset that I will not do that for you. I am sorry you feel that way. How can I help? Just remember that when you empathize, changing your no will not help. Offer other options. If you keep your boundaries, those who are angry at you will have to learn self-control for the first time instead of other control, which has been destructive. 
to them anyways. When they no longer have control over you, they will find a different way to relate. The hard truth is that sometimes they will not talk to you anymore, or they will leave the relationship if they can no longer control you. True risk. Our no becomes as free as our yes. When you are free to say no to a request as you are to say yes, you are well on your way to boundary maturity. There's no conflict, no second thought, no hesitation in using either word. Boundary injured individuals make promises and then do one of two things. One, they resentfully make good, or two, they fail on the promise. Boundary developed people, however, make good freely and gladly, or they don't promise at all. Following up on guilt-ridden or compliant responsibilities can be quite costly, painful, and inconvenient. The lesson you need to learn is not to promise too much before you have done your spiritual and emotional calculations. Individuals with mature boundaries aren't frantic, in a hurry, or out of control. They have a direction in their lives, a steadily moving toward their personal goals. They plan ahead. They reward for the reward for their wise boundaries is the joy of desires fulfilled in life. There will be all sorts of resistance to our boundaries and goals. Trying to take responsibility for XYZ's feelings is trying to own something God never gave me. We all need to grow our boundaries. We all need to grow in our boundaries, and increasingly so throughout life. In the end, God's way of ordering our lives and relationships really do work. Guilt-inducing statements that try to make them feel bad. You know that if I had it, I would give it to you. You have no idea how much sacrificed. You have no idea how much we sacrificed for you. Maybe after I'm dead and gone, you'll be sorry. Guilt manipulation dressed up in God talk. How can you call yourself a Christian? Doesn't the Bible say, honor your parents? You're not being very submissive. I'm sure that grieves the Lord. I thought Christians were supposed to think of others. What kind of religion would teach you to abandon your own family? You must really have a spiritual problem to be acting this way. People with poor boundaries almost always internalize guilt messages leveled at them. They obey guilt-inducing statements that try to make them feel bad. How could you do this to me after all I've done for you? It seems that you could think about someone other than yourself for once. If you really loved me, you would make the telephone call for me. If you really loved me, you would make this telephone call for me. It seems you were it seems you would care enough about the family to do this one thing. How can you abandon the family like this? You know how it's turned out in the past when you haven't listened to me. After all, you never had a life. You never had to lift a. After all, you never had to lift a finger around here. It seems like it's time you did. Tips to recognize external guilt messages. Probably everyone is to some degree able. Probably everyone is able to some degree to recognize guilt messages when they hear them. But if you feel bad about your boundaries, maybe you have not looked specifically at the ones your family or other people are using. One. Recognize guilt messages. Some people swallow guilt messages without seeing how controlling they are. Be open to rebuke and feedback. You need to know when you are being self-centered. Guilt messages are not given for your growth and good. They are given to manipulate and control. Tips to recognize external guilt messages. Guilt messages are really anger in disguise. The guilt senders are failing to openly admit their anger at you for what you are doing, probably because that would expose how controlling they really are. They would rather focus on you and your behavior than on how they feel. Focusing on their feelings would get them too close to responsibility. Tips to recognize external guilt messages. Guilt messages hide sadness and hurt. Instead of expressing and owning these feelings, people try to steer the focus onto you and what you're doing. Recognize that guilt messages are sometimes an expression of a person's sadness, hurt, or need. If guilt works on you, 
Recognize that this is your problem and not theirs. Realize where the real problem is, inside. Then be able to deal with the outside correctly, with love and limits. If you continue to blame other people for making you feel guilty, they still have power over you and you are saying that you will only feel good when they stop doing that. Stop blaming other people. You are giving them control over your life. Tips to recognize external guilt messages. Do not explain or justify. Only guilty children do that. This is only playing into their message. You do not owe guilt sinners an explanation. Just tell what you have chosen. If you want to tell them why you have made a certain decision to help them understand, this is okay. If you wish to get them not to make you feel bad or to resolve your guilt, you are playing into their guilt traps. Tips to recognize external guilt messages. Be assertive and interpret their messages as being about their feelings. It sounds like you are angry that I chose to dot dot dot. It sounds like you are sad that I will not dot dot dot. I understand you are very unhappy about what I have decided to do. I'm sorry you feel that way. I realize this is disappointing to you. How can I help? It's hard for you when I have other things to do, isn't it? Main principle. Empathize with the distress people are feeling, but make it or learn that it is their distress. Main principle, empathize with the distress people are feeling but make it clear that it is their distress. Tips to recognize external guilt messages. Stop reacting, be proactive, give empathy. Sounds like life is hard right now. Tell me about it. Sometimes people who give guilt messages just want to tell someone how hard it is. Be a listener, but don't take the blame. The consequences of setting boundaries will be counter moves by controlling people. They will react to your act of boundary setting. Loving God and our neighbor is difficult. One of the main reasons it's so difficult is because of boundary problems, which are essentially problems of responsibility. We do not know who is responsible for what, where, and someone else begins. We do not know who is responsible for what, where we end and someone else begins, where God ends and we begin. God respects our no. He tries neither to control nor nag us. He allows us to say no and go our way. In the safety of grace, which was allowing him to see himself as he really was, he began to regret who he was. He began to see the emptiness of his heart. When he owned who he really was from his heart, he did not like himself. He was developing godly sorrow, the kind that leads to repentance, the kind that leads to repentance, and he began to change. If we are trying to do God's work for him, we will fail. If we are wishing for him to do our work for us, he will refuse. But if we do our work and God does his, we will find strength in a real relationship with our creator. Boundaries are inherent in any relationship God has created, for they define the two parties who, we, who are loving each other. In this sense, boundaries between us and God are very important. They are not to do away with the fundamental oneness or unity that we have with Him. John 17, 20-23 But they are to define the two parties in unity. There is no unity without distinct identities. And boundaries define this and boundaries define the distinct identities involved. God is a good model. When we are hurting, we need to take responsibility for the hurt and make some appropriate moves to make things better. 
This may mean letting go of someone and finding new friends. It may mean forgiving someone and letting them off the hook so we can feel better. Whenever God decides that enough is enough and he has suffered long enough, he respects his own property, his heart, enough to do something to make it better. He takes responsibility for the pain and makes moves to make his life different. He lets go of the rejecting people and reaches out to some new friends. We do not like others trying to manipulate or control us with guilt, and neither does he. When we make our feelings and wishes from known to God, when we make our feelings and wishes known, God responds. One of the most astounding teachings of the Bible is that we can influence God. It wouldn't be a real relationship if we couldn't. God is free from us. When he does something for us, he does it out of choice. He is not under compulsion or guilt or manipulation. He does things like dying for us because he wants to. We can rest in his pure love. He has no hidden resentment in what he does. His freedom allows him to love. We call people bad because they do what, what we call people bad because they do not do what we want them to do. We judge them for being themselves, for fulfilling their wishes. We withdraw love from them when they do what they feel is best for them, but is not what we want them to do. We do the same thing with God. We feel entitled to God's favor. In our deeper honesty and ownership of our true person, there is room for expressing anger at God. We fear both abandonment and retaliation. Until they feel ang until they feel the anger, they cannot feel the loving feelings underneath the anger. Many people who are cut off from God shut down emotionally because they feel it is not safe to tell him how angry they are at him. Until we can own our boundaries with God, we can't ever change them or allow him to work with them. God respects our boundaries in many ways. First, he leaves work for us to do that only we can do. And he allows us to experience the painful consequences of our behavior so that we will change. He is not willing for any of us to perish and he takes no pleasure in our destruction. 2 Peter 3, 9, Ezekiel 18, 23. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and, re and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Matthew 22, 37 through 40. Boundaries resolve responsibility conflicts. We have met the enemy and he is us. Pogo Apostle, Walt Kelly. Boundaries are biblical. We begin setting limits on others. We begin moving from taking too much responsibility to, take, to taking just enough. We begin moving from taking too much responsibility to taking just enough. Look at our own internal boundary conflicts. Instead of taking a defensive posture, we are much better off to look humbly at ourselves, to ask for feedback from others, to listen to people we trust, and to confess, I was wrong. Healthy, fulfilled, happy people have self-control and maintain good boundaries with ourselves. With ourself. The problem often isn't the high cost of living. It's the cost of high living. When we have difficulty saying no to spending more than we should, we run the risk of becoming someone else's servant. The rich rule over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. Self-time boundaries. People whose time is out of control inconvenience others whether they mean to or not. Causes. 1. Omnipotence. These people have unrealistic, somewhat grandiose expectations of what they can accomplish in a given amount of time. No problem, I'll do it, is their motto. Over-responsibility for the feelings of others. They think leaving a party too early will insult the host. 3. Lack of realistic anxiety. They live so much in the present that they neglect to plan ahead. 4. Rationalization. 
They minimize the distress and inconvenience that others must put up with. Self-task completion boundaries. Resistance to structure. Poor finishers feel that submitting to the discipline of a plan is, put, is a put down or cramps their style. Fear of success. Poor finishers are over concerned that success will cause others to envy and criticize them. Better to shoot themselves in the foot than to lose their buddies. Lack of follow through. Poor finishers have an aversion to the boring nuts and bolts of turning the crank on a project. Distractibility. Poor finishers are unable to focus on a project until it's done. They often have never developed competent concentration skills. Inability to delay gratification. Poor finishers are unable to work through the pain of a project to experience the satisfaction of a job well done. Inability to say no to other pressures. Poor finishers are unable to say no to other people and projects. The words we use can be a source of both blessing and cursing. They can be a blessing when we use them to empathize, identify, encourage, confront, and exhort others. Words can be a curse when we use them to hide from intimacy, hide from intimacy by talking nonstop, dominate conversations to control others, gossip, make sarcastic remarks expressing indirect hostility, threaten someone expressing direct hostility, gain approval through flattery, give the silent treatment, withholding words to punish someone, massage the truth in order to look better seduce or manipulate. Restrain refers to the free action of holding back something or someone. The actor has the power over the object. One of the first signs that you're beginning to develop boundaries is a sense of resentment, frustration or anger at the subtle and not so subtle violations in your life. Your anger can alert you to boundary violations in your life. XYZ had some had come from a family that largely avoided conflicts and disagreement. Arguments were replaced by compliance. People who can't get angry when they are being violated, manipulated, or controlled have a genuine handicap. The warning light, which alerts one to boundary problems, should turn on quickly when you are being attacked. Anger is like a fire that shoots up from with anger is like a fire that shoots up within your heart, letting you know there is a problem to confront. An inability to get angry is generally a sign that we are afraid of the separateness that comes with telling the truth. We fear that saying the truth about our unhappiness with someone will damage the relationship. When we acknowledge that the truth is always our friend, we often give ourselves permission to be angry. Do I have permission to fool angry? Do I have permission to feel angry when I'm controlling up? Do I have permission to feel angry when I'm controlled by others? Am I aware when I'm being violated? Can I hear my early warning signal? Work on finding a safe place to tell the truth. As you are better able to be honest about differences and disagreements, you will be better able to allow your anger to help you. People with immature limit setting abilities often find themselves involved with boundary busters. The boundary confusion seems normal to them, so they aren't very aware of the destruction it causes for themselves and others. As boundary injured individuals begin developing their own boundaries, a change occurs. They become attracted to people who can hear their no without being critical, without getting hurt, without personalizing it, without running over their boundaries in a manipulative or controlling fashion. When we find relationships in which we can have freedom to set limits, something wonderful happens. When we find relationships in which we have freedom to set limits, something wonderful happens. In addition to the freedom to say no, we find the freedom to say a wholehearted, unconflicted, gratitude-driven yes to others. When we become attracted to boundary lovers, because we become attracted to boundary lovers, because in them we find permission to be honest, authentic, 
loving individuals. We need to join with boundary lovers in deep, meaningful attachments. Boundaries can't develop in a vacuum. As we make connections involving asking for support and understanding with boundary lovers, God gives us, through them, the grace and power to do the hard work of limit setting. As we begin developing close and meaningful connections with people who have clear boundaries, we begin growing in boundaries in our present relationships or finding new attachments in which to invest or both. Why is it so important to join the Boundaries family? As with any spiritual discipline, boundaries can't be worked out in a vacuum. We need others with the same biblical values of limit setting and responsibility to encourage us, practice with us, and stay with us. You will begin to see that taking responsibility for yourself is healthy, and you will begin to understand that taking responsibility for adults is destructive. And you will begin to see that taking responsibility for other adults is destructive. When people are treated as being, when people are treated as objects for too, when people are treated as objects for long enough, they see themselves as someone else's property. They don't value self-stewardship because they relate to themselves the same way significant others have related to them. Many people are told that nurturing and maintaining their souls is selfish and wrong. They place little value on taking care of the feelings, talents, thoughts, attitudes, behavior, body, and resources God entrusted to them. Our basic sense of ourselves, of what is real and true about us, comes from our significant primary relationships. We are to value our treasures so much that we keep them protected. Begin a list of your treasures, your time, money, feelings, and beliefs. How do you want others to treat them? How do you want others not to treat them? Ask your support group or your good friends if you could work on boundaries with them. They will show you their true value in their response to your truth telling. Either they'll warmly cheer you on in being able to either they'll warmly cheer you on in being able to disagree with and confront them, or they'll resist you. Boundary injured individuals are slaves. They struggle to make value based decisions on their own, but they most often reflect the wishes of those around them. Even though they can be surrounded by supportive boundary lovers, they still experience trouble setting limits. The culprit here is a weak conscience or an overactive and unbelievably harsh internal judge. Because of our overactive judge, weak conscience, boundary injured individuals often has a great difficulty setting limits. Questions. Aren't you being too harsh? How can you not attend the party? What a selfish thought are raised. Imagine the havoc when the struggler actually sets a limit or two, even a small one. The conscience moves in to overdrive, as its unrealistic demands are being disobeyed. This rebellion against honest boundaries is a threat to the parental control of the conscience. The parental control of the conscience attacks the soul with vigor, hoping to beat the person into submitting again to its untruthful do's and don'ts. Our real target is maturity, the ability to love successfully and work successfully. Boundary setting is a large part of maturing. We can't really love until we have boundaries. Otherwise, we love out of compliance or guilt. We can't really be productive at work without boundaries. Otherwise, we're so busy following others' agendas that we're double-minded and unstable. James 1-8 The goal is to have a character structure that has boundaries and that can set limits on self and others at the appropriate times. Having internal boundaries results in having boundaries in the world. For as he thinks within himself, so he is. Proverbs 23, 7. Developing a well-defined, honest, and goal-oriented character structure produces this step. Having internal boundaries results in having boundaries in the world. For as he thinks within himself, so he is. Proverbs 23, 7. The first step in a boundary 
existence will most likely be met by the harsh existence of an overactive and weak conscience. With consistent work and good support, however, the guilt diminishes. Shift allegiance spiritually and emotionally. Respond to the biblical values of love, responsibility, and forgiveness. These values will have for the heart somewhere to go for self-evaluation besides a critical conscience. The heart rests in the emotional memories of loving, truthful people. Loving others' boundaries confronts our selfishness and omnipotence. When we are concerned about protecting the treasures of others, we work against the self-centeredness that is part of our fallen nature. We become more other-centered. Loving others' boundaries increases our capacity to care about others. We genuinely care for another person because we gain nothing by helping someone tell us no. The advantage in loving others' boundaries is that it teaches us empathy. We should fight for the no of others just as we should fight for our own no, even if it costs us something. The problem in most internal boundary conflicts, sexual boundarylessness becomes a tyrant, demanding and insatiable. No matter how many orgasms are reached, the desire only deepens and the inability to say no to one's lust drives one deeper into despair and hopelessness. Substance abuse creates devastation in the lives of addicts. Divorce, job loss, financial havoc, medical problems, and death are the fruits of the inability to set limits in these areas. What's the problem? Why doesn't our no work on ourselves? One, we are our own worst enemies. Two, we withdraw from relationship when we most need it. Our instincts have been to withdraw from a relationship when we are in trouble, when we most need other people. Our lack of security, our loss of grace, our shame, and our pride, we turn inward rather than outward. Self-boundary problems will worsen with increased aloneness. Three, we try to use willpower to resolve our boundary problems. Will is only strengthened by relationship. We can't make commitments alone. The Greek word for self-imposed worship is will worship. We trust people more than we view them. We trust people more when we view them as being similar or familiar. People trust those who are in their in-group. Belonging is a primal instinct. And if you can trigger that instincts, the sense that, oh, we see the world the same way, then you immediately gain influence. When our counterpart displays attitudes, beliefs, ideas, even modes of dress, that are similar to our own, we tend to like and trust them more. Thus they have to take what they think are steps backward to learn to connect with others. Connecting with people is a time investment, risky and painful process. Finding the right people, group or church is hard enough, but after joining up, admitting your need for others may be even more difficult. Plugging in is neither an option nor a luxury. It is a spiritual and emotional life and death issue. Address your real need. Often out of control patterns disguise the need for something else. Allow yourself to fail. Addressing your real need is no guarantee that your out of control behavior will disappear. Embrace failure instead of trying to avoid it. People who are growing up are also drawn to individuals who bear battle scars worry furrows and tear marks on their faces. Their lessons can be trusted much more than the unlined faces of those who have never failed and so have never truly lived. Listen to empathetic feedback from others. Other believers can provide perspective and support. Hear truth and love from a peer. Hear how what is done helps or damages those that are loved. This kind of confrontation builds an empathy-based morality, a love-based self-control. Welcome consequences as your teacher. Learning about sowing and reaping is valuable. It teaches us the, that what we it teaches us that what we suffer that it teaches us that we suffer losses when we aren't responsible. 
Learning how to develop better self-boundaries is an orderly process. First, we are confronted about the destructiveness of our behavior by others. Then consequences will follow if we don't heed the feedback. Words precede actions and give us a chance to turn from our destructiveness before we have to suffer. Surround yourself with people who are loving and supportive. As you hear feedback and suffer consequences, maintain close contacts with your support network. Your difficulties are too much to bear alone. You need others who will be loving and supportive, but who will not rescue. Generally speaking, friends of people with self-boundary problems make one of two errors. One, they become critical and parental. This encourages the person to either look some elsewhere for a friend, no one needs more than two parents, or simply to avoid the criticism instead of learning from consequences. Replace this position with gentle restoration, understanding that there but for the grace of God I go. Two, they become rescuers. They give in to their impulse to save the other person from suffering. The five-point formula for developing self-boundaries is cyclical. As you deal with real needs, fail. Get empathetic feedback. As you deal with real needs, fail. Get empathic feedback. Suffer consequences and are restored. You build stronger internal boundaries each time. As you stay with your goal and with the right people, you will build a sense of self-restraint that can truly become part of your character for life. If you are a victim in cases, three factors remain constant. Helplessness, injury, and exploitation. The results. Depression. Compulsive disorders. Impulsive disorders. Isolation. Inability to trust others. Inability to form close attachments. Inability to set limits. Poor judgment in relationships. Further exploitation in relationships. Deep sense of pervasive badness. Shame, suicidal feelings and thoughts, guilt, chaotic lifestyle, sense of meaninglessness and purposelessness, unexplainable terror and panic attacks, phobias, rage attacks. We need to be able to trust our own perceptions of reality and to be able to let significant people matter to us. Our ability to trust ourselves is based on our experience of others as trustworthy. Victims often lose a sense of trust because the perpetrator was someone they knew as a child or someone who was important to them or someone they knew as children. When the relationship became damaging to them, their sense of trust became broken. Victims feel that their resources, body, and time should be available to others just for the asking. They feel they, aren't, they, feel they are public property. Victims have, over permeable, victims have over permeable boundaries because of the severity of their injuries. Destruction of a sense of ownership over the victim's soul is a damaging effect of abuse or molestation. Your boundaries with yourself can be restored and strengthened. Have great hope that with help, healing, and practice, you will be able to develop the self-boundaries you need. The Bible is a living book about relationships. Relationships of God to people, people to God, and God to each other, and people to each other. Establishing and maintaining boundaries takes a lot of work, discipline, and most of all, desire. Even with the desire for a better life, we can be reluctant to do the work of boundaries for another reason. It will be a war. There will be skirmishes and battles. There will be disputes. There will be losses. We have to fight for our healing as well process of healing is regaining our boundaries. The battles fall into two categories, outside resistance and inside resistance. The resistance we get from others and the resistance we get from ourselves. The most common resistance one gets from the outside is anger. People who get angry at others for setting boundaries have a character problem, self-centered. They think the world exists for them and their comfort. They see others as extensions of themselves. Angry people have a character problem. The feeling is that they are entitled to things from others. They want to control others, and as a result, they have no control over themselves. 
When they lose their wish for control over someone, they lose it. They get angry. The person who is angry at you for setting boundaries is the one with the problem. If you do not realize this, you may think you have a problem. Maintaining your boundaries is good for other people. It will help them learn what their families of origin did not teach them, to respect other people. Anger is only a feeling inside the other person. Staying separate from another's anger is vitally important. If you are either rescued from it or take it on yourself, the angry person will if you either rescue him from it or take it on yourself, the angry person will not get better and you will be in bondage. Do not let anger be a cue for you to do something. People without boundaries respond automatically to the anger of others. They rescue, seek approval, or get angry themselves. There is great power in inactivity. Just allow him to be angry and decide for yourself what you need to do. Figure out what it is that you are getting for your lack of boundaries and what you stand to lose by setting boundaries. Many people are cut off by the family they grew up with when they stop playing the family's dysfunctional games. Their parents or their friends will no longer speak to them. Others have what psychologists call character disorder. They don't want to be they don't want to take responsibility for their own actions and lives. When their friends and spouses refuse to take responsibility for them, they move on. When you count the cost, the con when you count the cost of the consequences as difficult or as costly as they seem, they hardly compare to the loss of your very self. Luke 9, 23-25 Know the risk and prepare, says the Bible. Decide if you are willing to risk loss. Boundaries without consequences are not boundaries. You must decide if you are willing to enforce the consequences before you set the boundaries. Be diligent about making up for what you have lost. Make new friends, new arrangements, or learn to deal with loneliness. Do it. There is no way of dealing with the power moves of others and the consequences of our boundaries Others, than setting the boundaries and going through with your plan. Go out and do it and look for God's help. Realize that the hard part is just the beginning. Realize that the hardest realize that the hard part is just beginning. Setting the limit is not the end of the battle. It is the beginning. Now is the time to go back to your support group and use them to spiritually nourish you so that you will be able to keep your stand. Keep working the program that got you ready to set your boundaries. Counter moves to your boundary setting are tough to battle, but God will be there to match your efforts as you work out your salvation. When we begin to set boundaries with people we love, a really hard thing happens. They hurt. They may fill a hole where you used to plug up their aloneness, their disorganization, or their financial irresponsibility. Whatever it is, they will feel a loss. When you are dealing with someone who is hurting, remember that your boundaries are both necessary for you and helpful for them. If you have been enabling them to be irresponsible, your limit setting may nudge them towards responsibility. Blamers will act as though you're saying no is killing them, and they will react with the how could you do this to me message. They are likely to cry, pout, or get angry. Remember that blamers have a character problem. Attend a workshop on boundaries. Listen to the nature of other people's complaints. If they are trying to blame me for something they should take responsibility for, confront them. Attend an assertiveness workshop. You may need to set boundaries on people in real need, but there are limits to what you can and can't give. You may need to say appropriately. These are not cases of giving reluctantly or under compulsion. These are instances in which your broken heart wants to give, but you would burn out if you did. Learn what your limits are. Give what you have decided in your heart to give and send other people in need to those who can help them. Empathize with these people's situation. They often need to know what they often need to know that you see their needs as valid and that they really do need help. And pray for them. Many people have a problem determining the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. They feel to deal with external resistance because they feel that they have to give in to the other person again or they are not being forgiven. Many people are afraid to forgive because they equate that with letting down their boundaries one more time and giving the other person the power to hurt them again. <laughs> 